mature forest of gigantic trees and shrubs. Mendocino cypress with its distinct smell and round cones. Everything so big and luscious. Manzanita, an ericaceous shrub. And another even bigger, a rhododendron. Aren't they doing well? Huckleberry, a real fat specimen. And Salar growing as big as I've ever seen it. A forest in every sense of the word, pouring down its leaf litter every year onto a big hearted soil. Let's take a look, down below. Now, there's the thick pad of litter, and it's rotting very, very slowly to produce this thick layer of black humus. But of course, rain can still percolate down to it, and as it does, it picks up organic acid and begins to leach away. And can you see there this wonderful ashy, grey horizon beginning to develop. The clay and the other minerals thus become mobile and they're washed through the soil to be laid down in the deeper layers. Nice brown streaks. Looks like rust and it is. That iron and here and there yes, a, a nodule. Now that's not one of the original beach pebbles but a concretion of clay and iron together. But lower down in the profile we can still find those beach pebbles but very, very much change because I can easily break them open. You see, and they're beginning to crumble away into their constituent chemicals. So they're releasing nutrients. And as the plant roots can go all the way down through the soil, they can tap that which supplies the mineral. So it started off as a molly soil and now an alfie soil. Alfie because both aluminium and ferric and ferrous iron are being moved down through the soil, enough minerals to support a lush climax forest. Great changes have already taken place, but there's still more to come. So now I've got two soil profiles, one called Molly and the other Alfie, to carry on my way to step number four, further inland and much further back in time. We're getting quite good at this, aren't we? The end of our journey through time. This soil is at least 100,000 years older than the last. It started its life as a molly soil and then through to the structured alfie soil, and now it's a pod soil. Now, pod means ash, and look at the thickness of this ash white layer. All the clay and the nutrients have been leached out and laid down, not as discrete nodules, but as a thick layer, an iron pan, never mind the rusty colour, just listen to the strength. Now no plant roots going to be able to get down through that to any mineral nutrients below, and as they've all been leached out from above, the plants here are going to be on starvation rations. Thanks to the great staircase of time, we all now know why. And the vegetation noted, gone are those magnificent big forest trees, replaced by the Mendocino cypress, still nice and aromatic with its weird cones, and Bolander's pine. Now, both these trees are well over 100 years of age, and they're never going to get any bigger, and the same goes for the rest of them, round about. Remember the forest giant, back on step number three. Here, the manzanita's only about as tall as me little finger. Huckleberry thin. Much of the bush is already dead, and even the leading shoots are covered with disease. It is really having a tough time. Salal, a miniature of its former self. And the rhododendron, not doing much better. And those yellow leaves are a sure sign of nutrient deficiency. So, given time and the right conditions, any developing soil should go through its own life history. In youth, well, here it was a molly soil, and then through the maturity of climax forest on alfy soil, and through to old age, ashen grey podsols, so devoid of nutrients that they could no longer support a robust 
diverse vegetation. And it all happened right here on this spot. Molly, Alfie, Pod. Sounds like some wacky rock group, doesn't it? And of course it is, because that's how they started, as grey, wacky rock. Now, if the theory is correct, pygmy forest should be quite widespread. And with the whole of California in front of me, I should be able to put the theory to the test. What a lovely way of looking for pygmy folk, floating high over the state of California. But there's not a pygmy tree in sight. <laughs> I should have read the tourist brochures. Of course, I'm floating over the biggest and tallest trees in the whole world, covering the landscape from the mountains to the sea. And they're all softwoods. Well, of course, softwoods don't have flowers. They bear cones, and inside the cones are the seeds. Yes, after successful pollination, the seeds begin to form, and then the female cone hangs about on the tree, and at maturity, a slight bit of growth opens up the cone scales, and then the sun dries them off, and they open up and out for the seeds. But not this one. This is rather a special one. And it's the knob cone pine. You can see there's a little knob one on the back of each one of the cone scales. Now, this can hang about on the trees for 30 or even more years, and it will only open once a forest fire has gone by, so it needs a lot of heat. Well, here am I floating about in a hot air balloon, so I should be able to make it work. It's going to take a little bit of time, so hang around. Oof, oof. Oh, that didn't do me fingers any good, but it was exactly what the knob cone pine cone wanted. It thought it was a forest fire, and the whole cone scales were popped open, and there you are, there you can see the seed, membranous seeds, and they're lying naked on the cone scales. They're not enclosed in a fruit, they're naked, and that's what gymnosperm means, gymnos, naked. Now, each one of those seeds are beautifully adapted for uh, dispersed all by the wind, and there you are, there's the black seed on the end, and, and a membranous wing, which will allow it to float away. And as we're still way up at altitude, I'm going to do a bit of dispersal. Look out below! From up here, it's easy to see all the different kinds of trees, and when you can fly down close enough, you can even collect a specimen a sprig of very special leaves. See, each one tightly imbricated, wrapped round the stem, so they hardly look like leaves at all. And the cone, the smallest one in the collection, but I tell you, it comes from the biggest tree of all. Now for the tree itself. And there it is, a giant among giants, almost 100 metres, 300 feet tall. Let's go down and take a look. Giant redwoods are amongst the largest things that have ever lived on Earth and they are perhaps the fastest growing. A tree like this could put on an incredible six and a half cubic metres of wood a year, and they can be as much as 2,200 years of age. But here, there's no need just to feel the length. You can actually get inside this one and enjoy the width. Sequoia dendron giganteum. A giant redwood! Each of these giant trees started its life as a tiny seed, which blew here on some chance wind, germinated and grew into maturity and beyond. And all this and the fantastic productivity and diversity of the forest is supported by living soil, which, remember, started its life off as volcanic rock, fire-born from some volcano. And here, in time, it weathered to a maturity of its own. 
And there are the clay minerals. Remember their magic. They hold the nutrients safe against the leaching power of the rain, but in a form in which they are available to the continued growth of all these forest giants. Leaving the forest giants behind, our search for pygmy trees takes us higher into the Sierra Nevada. And from here on up, climatic conditions are just too harsh for the growth of any trees at all. So where does that leave the theory of those tired old leach soils that can only support pygmy forests? Well, this isn't the end of my journey, and it isn't the end of my amazing story either. The tops of most mountains are made up of solid rock, but not so this one. The whole ridge consists of water-worked sediments boulders which have been rolled and rounded by the might of some great river, and pebbles, sands and silts which were laid down on the banks of its meanders. There is no doubt a mighty river once flowed along this way. They said anything could happen in California, especially when floating about in a balloon, and now I really do believe it, because this mountain ridge is just like the Grand Canyon, turned upside down, or rather inside out. The river gravels and boulders and silts have come up to form the ridge, and the layered solid rocks are down beneath. A real upside down world. And what about these fossils of the giant redwood taken out of the sediments of that river. Compare them to the modern stuff I collected on the way up. First, the shoot, and then the cone. The fits almost too perfect, but it's absolute proof that when this river was flowing, groves of redwoods were growing along beside its bank. And why? Because at that time, this whole section of the mountain ridge was 1,800 metres, yes, metres, lower than it is today. Like all the mountains which flank the west coast of America, these are young, still in the process of uplift and formation, as Mount St. Helens so spectacularly proved for us. The same is true for all the lands over which I've travelled. Geologically speaking, California is a young state which is still in the process of massive upheaval. Great mountains now stand where rivers once flowed through their own valleys, and already new rivers are cutting, eroding into the flanks of those new mountains. Why, every landscape through which I've passed, from the coast clear to the top of the Sierra Nevada, are young, they're still in the making. There just hasn't been enough time for their soils to weather into a state in which they can only support the growth of pygmy trees. They're young, they're fertile, full of promise, living soil, the very basis of every real estate in America. <laughs>